As he said, I'm Mitch Thompson. I work with our FBI Cyber Division. And I come out to events like this as often as I can to get our message out to you. And I'm here for you. And so I do encourage the questions. I do encourage if you have something pertinent at the time, raise your hand, holler it out. I do want to get you as much information and answer any questions I can for you. Cyber is something different to everybody. And in my job, I learned this from working with our counterparts within the U.S. government, our counterparts abroad, our foreign partners, the private sector, and most importantly, the victims. And so you have cyber, you have cyber scams, cyber fraud, you have intrusions, you have hacking, you have cyber-enabled crimes, you have unauthorized access, you have exceeding authorized access. All of this means something different to somebody in, in, in their own unique capacity. Any lawyers in the room probably know exactly the difference between all of those. As law enforcement, this is the challenge as we engage with our private sector partners and victims to decipher what is happening to them and how are we going to address this. While I'm here over the next hour, I want to talk to you about what the landscape looks like out there, where the threats are coming from, what's happened here in the last year or so within cyber, what we see is going to happen on the horizon, and then I want to talk about when you get, if something happens to you, what do you do? How do you contact the FBI? What resources do the FBI have to address these problems? Who are our partners? Do you call the FBI? Do you call the Secret Service? Do you call the NYPD? You know, who do you call and how do you do that? And then I'll give you some best practices and good hygiene that you've probably all heard before, but I'll reinforce what you've heard before. If there's something outside of that you want to know, definitely put it on the cards and pass it up and, uh, and ask me along the way. Because like I said, I'm here to answer anything that you might have and get any questions addressed that you might want addressed. The landscape. The landscape is pretty, it's complex, but it's simple, if, if that makes sense. Uh, if you look at it, we have hacktivists, and we kind of work through a spectrum. You have hacktivists, they're targeting people, and I see them all as adversaries. We have criminals, you know, getting into cyber for cyber crimes. We have insiders inside your organizations that are also an adversary or a threat. We have, we have espionage. We have people looking for espionage reasons. We're more, moving more into nation state. We have terrorism, people looking for a terrorist you know, attack or using cyber to help facilitate something associated with terrorism. And then we have warfare. Of all of those, the FBI has responsibility over all of those except their warfare. That's Department of Defense, DOD, anything .gov or Department of Defense is our warfare. And so that's a pretty wide spectrum that the FBI has responsibility for. We oversee all national security and most criminal investigations into cyber. We share the criminal responsibility with other federal law enforcement agencies such as HSI and U.S. Secret Service and a few others. And so in this, today I'm going to focus on the criminal, which I think is of what's most interest to you. You know, the insiders, I'm sure you've had an insider briefing, and uh, hacktivists could affect you as well, but criminals are something that's going to touch on you most regularly, almost every day. And so when you look at the environment from which these, these adversaries are operating from, you, know, you have the open web, you have the deep web, and you have the dark web. And, and you might wonder, well, I've heard of these, not sure what the difference is. And, and I like the analogy and the visualization of having an iceberg. And if you think of the open web as being the tip of the iceberg above the water. And so the open web is something you get on your internet search engine and you, you can look it up, you can Google, whatever it might be. That response is the open web. You have direct access to it from almost anywhere in the world. And then you have the deep web. And that's something you usually need a password or something to get into. And so you can't Google Mitch Thompson's Hotmail account and get into it. You, know, you need a password. You can't Google your own systems at your work and get into it. You know, you can't go into a, a Jabber server. You need an invite. And so that's the deep web. And then the dark web is the very bottom part of the iceberg. And as you can imagine, the visual of the iceberg, most of the stuff on the web is in the deep web. You know, that's the biggest chunk of it. But we don't have direct access to it. And that's where people want to get access to, or adversaries to. Then you have the, uh, the dark web. The dark web is the very bottom part of the uh, iceberg, and that's where Tor if you've heard of Tor, and it's an anonymous network within the web that our cyber actors you know, like to live and, and operate out of. And so if you look at this environment that these actors are operating out of, it's a pretty large space. And, and this space is constantly evolving, constantly shifting. You know, and if you look at Tor, Tor was invented by the US Navy in 2002. It was released to the general public in 2004. 
And so this is a completely anonymous way to surf the internet. It's very slow. If you don't know what Tor is, you can, you know, you can Google the torproject.org later and, and see what it is. But it's very slow. And if, you, if you've seen old movies and you've seen telephone calls being bounced around the world to you know, obfuscate where they're coming from, Tor is very similar to that. You know, it's encrypted. It goes around. It goes from one server to the next. The directions of what the next server to go to is wrapped in what looks like an onion, the onion router. And only the computer is coming from and going to knows where the next stop is. And so it's very difficult for law enforcement or anybody to trace that route. And so this has started giving an, an internet within the internet that gives complete anonymous nature of what people are doing on there. And so that is one step in technology that's making it more challenging for us in 2004. You know, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is the most common one we've heard of. You know, Bitcoin was first mined in 2009. So from 2002 to 2009, we're seeing a drastic shift in what criminals can have access to you know, on the internet. And so the first Bitcoin was created. Now Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency where you can, it's just like digital cash. You can exchange money and be completely anonymous. You've heard blockchain technology, that's what's behind it. You know, so you have you know, a, a, large, um, a large repository that you verify, yes, this is actual, you know, a Bitcoin wallet. Yes, it does have that amount in there. And you can transact with people, you know, anon anonymously. So now you have an anonymous network and anonymous currency. And so what's the next thing that would naturally come out of that? Somebody put in a, a marketplace within that anonymous network. And Silk Road was the first one to come out of that to sell drugs, to sell ransomware, malware, stolen artwork, you know, any other thing that you'd want that's illicit. And so, in that short time frame, Silk Road went online in 2011, and then we in FBI New York took it down in 2013. And so with, with this, you look from 2004 to 2011, you know, that's, what, seven years? You know, in a seven-year time frame, a complete new type of criminal activity, you know, engaged out of the Internet. You know, and this is, what, 2011, so that's what, six years ago, seven years, this is 2019 now, so that's eight years ago. You know, so it constantly continues to evolve. And so the complexities of what our adversaries are doing, what they have access to, continues to evolve. Cryptocurrency itself is evolving to different types of alt currencies you've heard of. So these are the issues we're, we're facing almost every day. Some of the trends we've seen, I'm pulling this from IC3. IC3.gov is FBI's Internet Cyber Complaint Center. And that's where a lot of online complaints go. At the end, I'll have resources. That'll be one of them, ic3.gov, that I'll throw out there. But some of the top things that we saw, and I pulled from 2017, 2018 report hasn't come out, but I spoke with them yesterday. IC3 says these are still our top, our top things, and the dollar amounts are somewhat consistent from year to year right now. Business email compromises. That should be something that everyone in this room should at least be made aware of. You know, we have public service announcements you know, so does FinCEN on these BECs. It, it's, it's something that's atrocious. It's a multi-billion. I think now we're up to like 18 or $19 billion losses globally in the last five years in this. And, and so something pretty pervasive. When you're listening to me, you, you're coming from three perspectives I see. You know, your company perspective, you know, for whatever organization you work for, your customer, your client's perspective, you know, because you want to protect them from any cyber attacks, and then your own personal. So, you know, for you, your friends, your family, your parents, any elder, uh, elderly in your family or friends, you know, the most vulnerable right now in these types of scams. But BECs, that's, that's where someone takes over or gets access to an email account and they target any wire transaction they physically can. You know, we've seen them take over a, an executive, you know, CFO's or a controller's email account, tell somebody else that we have a large acquisition in Southeast Asia and to wire a million dollars you know, and they time this while that executive is about to be in the air in a flight. And so what are they doing? They're also looking at their social media. They're looking at their LinkedIn. They're looking at Facebook. They're doing their homework around this. Uh, other variations of this is, is they'll get in, they'll get into your supply chain or a vendor and, and they'll send a different invoice. And so your vendor has the actual compromise and they're saying, oh yeah, we have a new account number. Send the new account number to uh, the, the new wire transaction to this other account in Southeast Asia, in Dubai, I haven't seen them go to Nigeria, you know, or even domestically. And, and you think it's coming from the person and you do it, and so the next invoice, you, the next payment you send out for an invoice is a fraudulent payment. And so from our perspective, we have the, the computer intrusion or the compromise 
is on the, 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 the supplier side and the financial loss is on you know, the, the, the purchaser side. And so we're starting to have multiple victims. And then to put the complexity of that into play, if you get across borders and you start having some of those you know, compromised overseas in India and the financial losses here domestically, a whole nother nuance in our investigations. And so I, I, BEC is worth me spending a couple more minutes on. I'll give you a recent case example of, of what a group out of Nigeria was doing. And, and we indicted eight on this, we've arrested three, and we still have uh, you know, five that are at large in Nigeria. But what they were doing, they had the group, they're high school friends, they've known each other for a long time. They would go and they would get online, act as an investment company. They would go to, to Compass or Experian Business out of the UK, and they would purchase controller financial uh, information on the officers of that of organizations, and so from the investigation, we know they purchased about a thousand for a thousand euros, you know, and so thousand contacts. They had the name, address, phone number. It's a cold call list for an investor, is essentially what it is. So they would do that. They would parse it out to a person on their team. That person would would take it and they start doing online research. So you take your 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 cold call list number one. Start doing all online research, scrub the, the website of the company, find any social media they have, and, and start getting a footprint. Send them an email, see what their out of, out of office reply might be. Start seeing start seeing the um, the the, uh, the font, the font size, the font type. You know, start getting any kind of information they can on that individual. Then someone else in the group would start targeting an individual with emails, whether it's a phishing email, whether they have embedded attachment you know, with malware, and they try to get access to that person's email account. And, and so in, in doing this, I see Microsoft 365 is a very successful product. What it's doing is giving people access you know, to, to their email in the, in, the, in the cloud, but it's also giving our adversaries access to that if the proper uh, protocols and, and protections aren't in place. And so what, and then they would successfully get access to that person's email account, and they'd sit there idle. You know, and I learned this through, through the proffers, uh, the, the interview of one of the subjects after the fact. This is their other, and they just monitor, and they see what's going on, and they're patient, you know, and they start setting up rules, you know, so they can start getting information sent to them, and the person behind their email doesn't realize they're doing this, you know, and so now they don't have to be in the account. They can have emails being sent to them. You know, their systems aren't being properly monitored internally, and in doing that, they start seeing financial transactions, and that's when they jump in. And they jump in, they know the signature line, they know, you know how the person talks, they know how casual the, the conversation might be, they know who needs a, a second uh, level of authority for a, um, for a large dollar, dollar amount wire transfer, and they'll inject themselves in there, they'll completely block all communications, redirect it to a, uh, to a similar domain email account, so you know, I'll use FBI, so instead of FBI.gov, it'd be FBI.com. And if somebody could buy a .gov account, it'd be FB1, something very similar, .gov. And so you know, they would just slightly do that, or they'd spoof an email account you know, using Google or Yahoo, whatever it might be. And so in, in doing this, they would, they would start seeing that. They would get in the middle of this transaction, you know, and they'd rewire the money. They'd send the money anywhere they needed to. And, and the way money laundering has set up these days, they're, they're so fluid and so efficient with it. You know, you can get in these WhatsApp groups that they all are, are part of and send money anywhere. I say, I need a million dollar account in China. And if I needed to go there right now, I could find a million dollar, an account in China that can hold a million dollar wire transfer. And so I'm going to pay a cut, but if I'm getting a million dollars, I don't mind paying 10, 15 percent. And so it's that simple, you know, and I see their motivation. Their motivation is to get, you know, a better extravagant lifestyle. That's all they want. You know, they're living it up. And in my presentation, it's great that when I talk about this case, you know, we have a picture of him from his social media, you know, in Nigeria with him and his buddies in tuxedos. And at the end of the presentation, I have him, you know, in, in Brooklyn, you know, with his shirt off, his tattoos, you know, and he's got a tattoo of, you know, Benjamin Franklin because he's on the $100 bill. Tattoo of the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, he's a very arrogant person. And so, you know, and, and, and gladly, we, we brought him and, and actually arrested that guy in the group in, uh, in South Africa and extradited him to the States. And, and so, but it shows their diligence. It shows how simple they, uh, their approach is. You know, and, and any of us in the room, and, and no matter what your education level is, you know, we easily could do this ourselves. And so it's part of their culture 
in a lot of the Western African countries, and it's not just Western Africa that's doing this, but you know, that, that's one thing, it's, it's pervasive. So I, I mentioned IC3, there's a good public service announcement, read into that. That one's probably the, one of the big ones that you'll touch, you or your customers or your loved ones. They're getting into real estate transactions as well. And, and, and so I see it all too often, people who don't do wire transactions regularly calling us, saying, hey, I have this type of scam, Someone said, wire the money for the house. I just had to put $5,000 down, but I had $300,000 and they wanted the full amount and they sent $300,000. And, and the money, it, it scatters pretty quickly. And so I'll get how we respond to that in here later on. But business email compromises was, was worth the 10 minutes there. Romance scams is something we see a lot of. And, and so this could be your customers, could be your family on this. You know, people who are lonely, people who are older and a spouse has passed away, people who have a lot of money in their retirement account have access to this. And so they'll get on these dating websites, they'll get on Facebook, they'll get on other areas, and they'll be targeted, you know? And, and it's interesting that they'll look at, they'll monitor, they'll do the same level of diligence. And they'll look into that. And once they identify the person, they'll start a conversation, they'll foster that conversation, they'll ask for money for some reason, the, it'll go from $10,000 and then go on up. You know, recently there, there's an elderly woman in Connecticut who sent $750,000 to a Western African man. And on two occasions, she thought he was, she was going to meet him, and so she drove to JFK Airport and waited for hours and before she finally got a hold of him as to whatever his excuse was why he couldn't show up. And, and so they're very believing, they're very vulnerable, the elderly are in these romance scams, you know, and, and these guys, they're ruthless, they don't care. And so uh, non-payment, non-delivery, it might not pertain to you too much, you know, that's, that's where someone orders something online, sells a product, sells a service online, and they never follow through with it. And so that's pretty pervasive as well. Investment scams might be something all of you are, are come across. Uh, that's pretty high on our list as well, and I'll, I'll put some dollar amounts to these. Um, even within investment scams, how, how a cyber relation is not necessarily an investment scam, but it's almost a pump and dump. I've had a case where we responded to a, uh, an intrusion, and someone was going in, and they were making small trades in, within an investment account. And they're making small trades, and, and, and the account holder probably didn't even notice it. You know, it went to the, the firm, and it didn't hit it because they would make a trade, and then they'd make a trade going back the other direction. So minimal loss. They're doing that across the board. And on the back side somewhere else is where they're making their money. You know, so that they would trade, you know, they would sell, 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 and then buy here when, they, when the dollar amount went low. And so that is where they're getting into these different accounts, and, and they're making money through that. Um, of these, BECs is our number one you know, thing we're seeing on, on dollar losses. In 2017, $676 million. $676 million in losses just in the United States or reported to IC3. Occasionally, we'll get some other countries to report to us as well. Uh, romance scams, $211 million. Kind of put things in perspective. Non-payment, non-delivery, 141. So that's a fraction of the BECs. Investment scams, under, under $100 million, $97 million. And then the hot topic and something they asked me to talk about was, um, was ransomware. Ransomware affects everybody. You know, everybody is vulnerable to this. It's a delivery mechanism. You know, they're getting more pervasive. They get more persistent with this. You know, early on when ransomware came out, they would get in, they'd set up the ransom right away, and they'd lock you out of your systems. Now they're getting in, they're waiting for you to do backups, and then they're getting deeper in your system, and they're getting more persistent, and they're finding out what kind of company you are. Are you Joe's Plumbing that might have $50,000 on hand? Or are you Bank of America that might have $500 million on hand? And so they're starting to tailor their ransom demands according to their company. And if they're in your backups of fixes, restore from backup because you know, you'll lose one day or however frequent your backup is. And, and so ransomware, if you're not patching, if you're not updating, if you're, if you're not getting the, the latest you know, uh, antivirus you know, on your systems, you're gonna be vulnerable to something like that. And so of these losses, you know, in 2017, 2.3 million in actual losses. Significantly lower than the others. You know, but the, but the damage is not to be minimized. And if they get in and lock you down, what's being reported to us through our Internet Crime Complaint Center are the actual dollar losses. And so that's the $1,000 or $500 or $5,000 they're demanding. That's not the lost business. That's not the, uh, the advisors. That's not the remedi remediation company you're hiring, outside counsel you know, that, that you're hiring to come in. And, and so the, the actual loss to the organization is significantly more than that. And, and so that's not to be underestimated. Uh, the FBI's policy and, and dictate around ransomware is do not pay it. You know, you're feeding the system. Um, call the FBI. There are a few variants that we can help you possibly unlock 
uh, very few variants, but there are some. Uh, and so get a hold of the FBI, and, and sometimes we can help. So other times we can advise you on, on, on what to do you know, on that. Uh, what we're seeing in, in 2019. Um, business email compromises again. That, that's still on the rise. You know, we, we've got groups every time I meet with our foreign partners, every time I meet with our local law enforcement, every time I meet with anybody you know, within the government, that's, that's a top topic for everyone across the board. They target English speaking because English is usually the international language of business. These aren't English speakers. I've seen some Spanish and, and they focus a lot on U.S. dollars. You know? and so, in the global transaction world, I've heard, I haven't confirmed this, that 85% of all transactions globally are in U.S. dollars. Makes sense, all the oil and gas, all in U.S. dollars, and so it's a very common you know, currency. And so that is response to the numbers. You know, that's why they're going after English speaking and, and U.S. dollars, because that's where all of the money is for them. Um, credential harvesting. That's where they're going out and stealing credentials in mass volumes. And, and how that could affect you, it could get you, could get your customers, you know, and they're taking those credentials and they're turning around and, and using it for, for several reasons. You know, one, they'll go to different banks and, and, and start, and they'll write a script, very simple, saying try this username and password on all these banks, you know, all these different bank accounts. So they'll go right down the list, JPMC, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and so on, just testing these accounts see if they can get in. You know, and they've got about a 1% success, success rate, which you know, for them that's quite high. You know, and so in doing that, they're trying that. Um, they're also using, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of this or not, they've, they're using it for almost extortion. You know, where somebody receives an email, they say, hey, we've seen what you've been doing online. We have we had malware on your computer. Here's your, here's your password to verify you've been doing this. And uh, send us $1,000. We're going to send it to all your contacts on your Facebook or your business contacts or, or whatever. You know, and people panic. They don't know what to do. And in reality, the, their, their credentials have been compromised from another already compromised event. The Yahoo compromise is, is one of the biggest ones that comes to mind. And so people reuse their passwords. So they think, oh, that is my password that this person just bought online, and they're just fishing to get money out of it. And people respond. And so if you, a colleague, or among your family gets something like that, the, the wording is the, almost the exact same for all of them. Report it to the FBI. We respond. We can give you some good advice on what to do. Um, there's a website out there. Uh, I've been pawned, P-W-N-E-D, something like that. Yeah, I'm not endorsing it, but it's a credible website that uh, yeah, I direct victims to to see, hey, had you been, have you been compromised? You put your email account in there. It'll say which breach that, that your email has been compromised in. So it's a, it's a researcher that's out there killing all these breaches and providing this service to people. Um, extortion, social engineering. Yeah, if you look at, uh, if you're trying to get into Fort Knox and, 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 and steal from the Fort Knox, you're not going to beat down the door. You're not going to take a bulldozer through it. You know, you're going to, the power of the tongue to get through the door and, and navigate your way in Fort Knox socially is probably your best, your best path of least resistance. Our cyber refugees take, our, our cyber adversaries take the exact same approach. They find the path of least resistance, whether it's criminal or nation state. You know, they'll, they'll social engineer, they'll call, they'll send emails, they'll do anything they do to manipulate somebody in some capacity to get them access to something, get them to click on something. You know, they'll, they'll pull on heartstrings that they need to, you know, with some. If they see that you're a, a large shopper at Kmart, they'll send you a, a $50 gift card coupon for Kmart, and you click on it, and you know, there'll be malware embedded in there. And, and so, you know, they'll, they'll use a social aspect you know, to get access to your systems, to your credentials, and use those to further exploit whatever they can around you or your, your environment. Um, card not present might not affect you too much, you know, or moving to chip and pen. Europe has done this years ago. And so we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing fewer skimmer devices, even though no one's, um, you know, fully embraced this at the, at the retail level. But online, you know, we're starting to see digital skimmers where they're writing scripts and malware to inject in these retail platforms that will skim credit cards, you know, out of this card not present. And then use this, those credit cards, you know, Magecart is a, is a big case right now, you know, a big group doing this. And, and use those credit cards to, to start, you know, buying other purchases online. You know, and so they'll buy... They'll buy either gift cards online, they'll use electronics, you know, sometimes, you know, jewelry, you know, ship it somewhere, then that reshipping comes into play. You know, and that's where work at home scams come into play, where people think they're working from home, but they're 
the job at home is to receive a laptop and then ship it to somebody else, you know, but they still do it. You know, a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense. Um, breaches of third party vendors or supply chain. And I talked about this briefly in the BECs. You know, whenever you're doing, you're looking at your own entity, your own organization, you know, large, large corporations do this, you know, and they have thousands of vendors in their supply chains or, or thousands of vendors they're, they're dealing with. You know, small organizations, you might have a handful of vendors. But one thing's the same for both of them. You must do the same level of diligence vetting out these vendors and, and looking at your supply chain as you would, whether, whether you're J.P. Morgan Chase or you're Joe's Plumbing. You know, you, you have the same obligation to look at your vendors, assess them, and whether you do business with them or not. If you're, if you're moving into the cloud, whether it's for computing or storage or processing, whatever it might be, you know, those vendors do the same level of diligence, diligence you would do with those vendors as you would if you're hiring that person and staff you have on hand. And so there's really no true excuse for being a five-person organization or 500,000-person organization you know, to, to have this. You should invest in that extra diligence to, to vet out who you're doing business with. Um, all right, when, if something happens, you know, what do you do? Who do you call? You know, how does the FBI respond? Um, I saw in the brochure that uh, I'm bookend by SEC in the morning, SEC in the end, you know, and I'm right in the middle to, to hopefully, you know, kind of show how we're the same but different you know, and what our responsibilities are. I wasn't here for the morning session, and so I'm not sure what they're saying, and so hopefully I'm going to be consistent, which I'm, I'm sure we are because we worked with them, you know, uh, pretty well in the past on these events. Uh, the FBI, I mentioned national security and criminal. We have the, uh, the authorization and the mandate to look at both national security and criminal. I work on the criminal side of the house. And we're seeing some nation state actors trickle over to criminal activity. And we're seeing some nation state actors utilize criminals to fil facilitate their work. And if I can get away with it, of course I'd want a criminal and, and it kind of obfuscate what I'm doing to have a criminal and, and throw somebody off their trail too. So we're starting to see a bit of the melding you know, between the two. You know, but nation states are still by far the more sophisticated. You know, and, and with the advance of the technology, though, you know, criminals and sophisticated criminal hackers are going to have some of the powers, you know, that these nation state hacker, hackers have access to. 5G is coming out, you know, processing is getting faster, you know, encryption is getting better off the shelf. So, you know, the, the, the criminal actors are catching up. They're still behind, you know, but the, the governments used to cost a lot of money to get ahead in this, in this field. Now, as technology is advancing, the criminals are staying, the, the sophisticated criminals are staying, you know, kind of uh, in pace with them right now. Um, so how do we address this and how do you respond? So if something happens to you, a family, uh, a member, someone in your, in your company, a customer, you know, who do you call? Uh, FBI, we've set up cyber task forces throughout uh, our organizations. We have 56 field offices across the country in every major city. Then within the field offices we have what we call RAs, resident agencies, so we have satellite offices. My first office out of the academy at the FBI was in Oklahoma City. And I'd never been to Oklahoma before I, I, I got assigned there. In Oklahoma City, I was shocked to hear that we had 15 offices in the state of Oklahoma. 15 FBI offices. Some in Tulsa, the largest, had about 30 or so agents. Some small out in the panhandle of Oklahoma had one or two agents. You know, but our network is pretty vast domestically. You know, meaning, if something happens to a victim, something happens you know, where a subject is out there, we have the reach to go out there and, and work with them. And so in cyber, it's, it's a bit unique because it's borderless. And, and something the state and local law enforcement have been challenging doing is, with it being borderless, they lose their venue, they lose their jurisdiction very quickly. And so I'll use, I'll use New York City as an example. That's where I live right now, and I'm, I'm very familiar with it. You have the five boroughs. And so you have a radius of approximately 15, you know, a 15 mile radius around the center of Manhattan. Anything outside of that, they have no jurisdiction, no venue. Well, our hackers don't care if you live in New York or LA. You know, they're gonna target you know, in New York, they're going to target LA. They're going to target the opportunity, not the location. And, and so we need to partner and work with our local and state law enforcement simply to give them access and give them authorities. So we deputize them and, and bring them in our task forces to investigate these types of crimes across the borders. So they can use federal process. They can use federal subpoenas. I had a guy in our task force from NYPD called a bank, a small bank in, uh, in Massachusetts. They said, nope, don't send me a subpoena. I'm not going to abide by it. I don't have, um, we don't have anything in New York. He's like, nope, I'm on a federal uh, task force. You'll get a federal subpoena. They said, okay. 
And so it alleviates these concerns, you know, with this. And we're looking at just domestically right now. And so we're building these task forces. And, and when Paul mentioned in the intro, you know, I, I built our task force in New York. We started with two agencies. And, and when I moved on from that position, you know, we left with 13 agencies. And so we have state, local, you know, federal. And then we also bring in some of the USIC, the, the U.S. intelligence uh, community, to work our nation state set stuff with us side by side. And so we're really opening up the full gamut of government resources available to address these problems within cyber. And so in doing that, that's just domestically. Abroad within the FBI, we have our legal attaches. And so we have FBI agents in 74 embassies around the world. And so they sit there every day. It's an opportunity anybody can go to if you're an agent. And, and you represent the Bureau over there. You work with our foreign counterparts on, on, on both you know, whatever crimes or whatever events might be. So they might do counterterrorism, they might do intelligence, they might do cyber, you know, the entire gamut of the FBI's responsibilities. But that gives us a global network. I mentioned how cyber is a global problem, you know, and our, our adversaries are global. This gives us the network to reach out and work with our foreign counterparts to do this. And so very frequently, you know, do, if, we're not, if we're working a cyber investigation and we're not going overseas in some capacity, whether we're going after our adversaries, the subjects themselves, their IT infrastructure, the servers they're using overseas, the financial infrastructure for wiring the money and stealing the money, you know, or the victims are often overseas as well. If we're not reaching out to this network, global network, that's not a true cyber investigation for us. Every one of the cases you know, in, the, in the four years I ran the squad in New York, every one of our cases went overseas. And so it's a global problem, and, and we're taking a global approach. You know, I was talking to some of the, some of the, our counterparts up here in the first table before I came up. You know, two weeks ago I was in San Diego meeting with, you know, our foreign partners and strategizing how we're tackling this problem and who has authority to do what in what jurisdiction and where, where do we get the best approach to find somebody, prosecute them, extradite them, and hold them accountable. You know, whether it's Canada, New Zealand, uh, Australia, UK, Germany, the Dutch, you know, these are the kind of conversations we're having, you know, from a government level, see how can we do this. And we meet with them every six months, and then, you know, the guys on the ground meet with them more regularly in between our sessions. And so that's the approach we're taking to address the problem. Um, we also work hand in hand with private sector. Um, some of this room has, have heard of NCFTA, National Cyber Forensic Training Alliance. It's a non-for-profit organization. It's a co-location center where private sector, public sector, and academia sit together to address some of these problems. Everybody pays into it as a membership. Everybody's equal members. But you sit there and, and you see problems that are going on. You know, if we work this, 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 this problem in a vacuum, the FBI, historically before we started working with private sector and academia, you know, it would take about two years from beginning to end to investigate a cybercrime. Once we start working with our partners in the private sector and academia, you know, we've really streamlined that, and our foreign partners, streamlined that for a cyber investigation to efficiently take about a year of investigation from beginning to end. And for the lawyers in the room, it's not to circumvent legal process. You know, we're very well aware of, of Bank Secrecy Act. We're also aware of U.S. Patriot Act 314 A and B. We're lo we know information sharing. We know our requirements, and, and we know the power of the grand jury subpoena. And we use the grand jury subpoena often, you know, not to compel, but to cover an agency or an organization. You know, say, so, hey, we might have something, you know, of interest that we've come across, you know, in our in our malware lab. I'm like, well, we, we want access to that. You know, it's nothing proprietary, it's nothing, no customer information, we want that. And so we have those kind of discussions. And so InfraGuard is another um, private sector partnership that we have. The FBI is heavily involved with that. I think we might have originated it and, and we sponsor it. And, and that's, where, that's where organizations can, can come together and they're, they're broken down by chapters in different parts of the country. Um, or you can come together, you have regular meetings, and it's a networking opportunity to share information, see the threats that are out there, it covers all sectors, and, and, and the cost of entry is, is pretty low. I think $75 or something, you know, to be part of that group. And, and so that's another opportunity for people to come together, share information, and see what the latest trends and, and things that are affecting, you know, each other. You know, oftentimes, and you might be, you know, guilty of this as I am, you know, something happens to me, sometimes to your organization, a family member, and it never gets reported to law enforcement. And so there are things out there that, you know, if you lose money, you're calling your bank, no doubt about it, you know. And so the banks know a lot more of what's going on in this space than we do. We know what's going on, but they have, you know, a pretty large picture of it. 
And you start putting all the banks together, you know, and that gives a full picture in conjunction with what we're seeing, then put our, our foreign partners in there. And, and so that's given us a full picture of, of this landscape so we can properly address it. Um, other FBI resources that we put at this. So we, we have SciWatch, a 24-7 you know, uh, center that we have, that we have some my own call 24-7, actually sitting in the center here in D.C., to, to respond to events, you know, that come up. So we do have, you know, a 24-7 response, you know, if you, if you look after everything shuts down here, you know, we're worried about what's going on in the rest of the world, so when the sun comes up the next day, we can address anything that we've missed overnight. And so they do a good job, you know, following the sun and seeing what's going on there. Uh, BAU, our Behavioral Analysis Unit, uh, we're working with them to set up profiles for our adversaries. And so we can kind of anticipate where they're going, what they've done, and then whenever we, whenever we put indictments on people, we can use this profile to help track them and lure them into a place, you know, where we can actually arrest them. And so we're using this to better assess, you know, our, our cyber adversaries. Um, and then our cyber action team is, is something someone uh, asked about as well. If you're in, I'll, I'll pick on El Paso. Uh, I know nothing about their cyber capabilities out there right now. But if you're in El Paso and you're a significant organization and, and you have a breach and our cyber footprint there might be two cyber agents, you know, and they need help responding to a significant breach, you know, to collect evidence, we have a cyber action team. It's a fly team. They'll get on a plane and they'll fly out there and, and help facilitate any response that we need. And so whether you're in El Paso, um, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, wherever you are, if something happens, the FBI has access to the resources to respond to it and respond to it immediately. And so keep that in mind as well. Um, before a cyber event happens, what should you be doing? Well, if you're a company, I'm sure you're mandated you know, by your facilities to have some kind of fire drill in place if you have a fire. You know, if you have an IT department, if you outsource your IT department to, to somebody else, you, know, you should have a policy or procedure in place if you have a cyber event. You know, when do you pull the fire alarm? You know, is it when you smell smoke, when you see smoke, when you see flames? You have that written somewhere and you know what to do and you follow those procedures and you even practice them annually. You should do the same thing on cyber side. You should have a policy. You know, if somebody is knocking on your door, if somebody is, is, is just pinging your system, is that a cyber event? If they get inside and, and don't do any damage, is that a cyber event? If they get inside and they've been inside for years and you haven't seen they've stolen anything, you know, is that an event? If they've stolen something but you have no money lost, is that an event? You know, I don't have the answer to that. But that's something you should have the answer to and you should be discussing this internally and, and, and your lawyers should definitely be involved in these conversations. And what I say, when do you contact the FBI or law enforcement? Contact them whenever your policy says, beyond this breach, we're contacting the FBI. What do I want as an FBI agent from you? I want it all. I mean, if somebody's just pinging on your door, I want to know that. I want those IP addresses. I, know what, I want to know what botnet is out there. I want to know the latest information. You know, if somebody gets in your system, I want to know what kind of company you are. What were they doing in your system? What are they looking for? You know, if they're stealing information, okay, is it your proprietary information? Is it your personnel information? Is it your financial information? You know, can I associate this person that's been inside your systems with another case, another victim within the Bureau? And so, you know, all of this is, is going to be based on what you're willing to share and what you're willing to provide. You know, we have IC3.gov. It's another plug for them. They're going to love me for this. But IC3.gov is, is a good place you can go and, and, and report stuff without expecting anything back from the Bureau. Like, oh, I, mean, I have these, the, all these IP addresses and, you know, they're from China. They seem suspicious and I, and I see a mandate report that might be associated with such and such. Well, I report that to IC3. You're not wasting anybody's time on our side and then if it's, a, if it's a false flag, we'll see it and we'll move on. And so we use IC3 as a large data aggregator. And so I'll step back to, to BECs for a second. Um, if you actually get a loss, a wire loss, and it's criminal in nature, they're sending money domestically as well as they're sending money overseas and they target people around U.S. banking holidays. And, and so if, if Monday's a holiday, I know I'm getting calls from people I know on Friday, and it's gonna be after 5 p.m. If Friday's the banking holiday, I'm getting them on Thursday. I know what I expected, and it's, it's, it's normal course of business for me. But what we've set up and what, are, what these adversaries are doing, they know Friday's a banking holiday, so Thursday they facilitate their crime. They send it to Southeast Asia over the international dateline. Now Hong Kong, I'll pick on Hong Kong, you know, they don't have a banking holiday on Friday. They don't have Columbus Day. They don't have Memorial Day. And so the money goes overseas. And so you realize at 5 p.m. on Thursday, well, that's 5 a.m. Friday morning in Hong Kong. 
Maybe the funds are there, maybe they're not, you know, you know, so they can withdraw them. So they're at 5 a.m., so they have an entire business day that Friday to do it. Then the weekend comes. You realize that Thursday after 5, you can't get access to your bank, you know, until Monday because Friday's a banking holiday. And you're very diligent. You want to go into the bank Monday at 8 a.m. to tell them you've lost your money and to do a swift recall. Because swift recall is what you want to do if, based on fraud, to recall the money back. And so Monday at 8 a.m. when you go into the bank and, and you get the first person that you ask for that swift recall, it's 8 p.m. in Hong Kong. So they've had all day Friday while you're down and all day Monday while you've been sleeping to withdraw your money. And so th that's just the nature of how we do business. In a global setting, there's not much you can do about it. Now, if you're a large organization and you have your banker on speed dial, yeah, you're in good shape. You can call your banker, wake them up. You know, but if you're a small organization or an individual or, or you're buying a house, you don't have that opportunity. And so we've set something up within the Bureau, and we partnered with FinCEN and Treasury Department. I mentioned our LEGAT network overseas for the Bureau. Treasury has their counterparts, their FIUs overseas as well. And so if something goes overseas, we reach out. You port to IC3, 3 a.m., you know, Friday morning. IC3 sends an email to our Watch, a 24-7 center. They reach out to our appropriate embassy around the world and say, Hong Kong, we reach out to Hong Kong police, tell them we've been, it's been reported as fraud, and will you ask the bank to freeze the money? Just freeze the money. We're not in the business of returning money. You don't want us to return money because it takes years. You know, just to freeze the money. Treasury does the same thing. You know, Treasury reached out to FinCEN's counterpart, you know, over in, uh, in Hong Kong in this example. Hong Kong will then reach out to the FI and say, will you please freeze the money that's being reported to the U.S. government as fraud? And so now, if the money is frozen, when the individual goes into the bank 8 a.m. on Monday, they tell them, now the money will be frozen and we allow the banks to work out the response. You know, and we tell the banks, uh, we tell the, the victim, do this, report it, We'll work it out. We'll keep in touch with the victim. If the money's not returned, let us know, and we'll tell you what the alternatives are. You know, federal forfeiture, and, and, and we start going down that path. You know, for us to forfeit money in Hong Kong, you know, I, I did it in Taiwan, and it was $2.4 million, and it took just over two years and, and to get it back. The guy was very appreciative, you know, but he couldn't get it back from bank to bank, and, and every bank's different. They ask for uh, uh, identification letters, hold harmless letters, whatever it might be, and, and that's just the nature of it. You know, but there are alternatives, and that's where, you know, working with the FBI, we can tell you from our experience what the alternatives are, and then you can make a business decision on how you want to try to get your money back. And we're still going to do an investigation, you know, into the adversaries, you know, on the other side. And so that's a, a cyber incident. So you, you report it to us. Uh, how do you get a hold of your local field office? You know, you can either, if you're an InfraGuard, talk to your InfraGuard coordinator. You know, if you don't have InfraCard, you don't even want to mess with that, I see three. I see you standing. You have a question already? We have a couple of audience questions Good, for you. good. Uh, on the subject of reporting, yes. is there a monetary floor for reporting? So, no. for example, if it only involves $5,000, do you still want to hear about it? I still, it sh yeah, the microphone wasn't all If there's a monetary floor for reporting, $5,000 adds up very quickly. As I said, they don't just target one person. You know, a good criminal wants as much money as possible, and so they might get 5,000 from 1,000 people. That's 500,000 very quickly. So if it's $5,000, report that to IC3, and we'll aggregate that, and it'll go to a, a field office for an investigation. If it's $500,000, call your local FBI office and ask for a cyber supervisor. It's that simple. And they say, well, just national security, or is it criminal? Ask for a criminal supervisor, because usually that's where all of our stuff starts. You know, but it's pretty simple you know, you know, for that. But yeah, the next question. A dark web question. If you know your name, social security number, credit card number, et cetera, uh, is in the, on the dark web, what should you do? Uh, I, 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 would, I would talk to Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, and, and, and get the, the, the stuff put in place there for identity theft. You know, assume your identity is stolen. Assume, assume if, <laughs> if it's out there, it's out there. There's nothing you can do to get it back. You know? But I would put the personal stuff, uh, personal procedures in place to help prevent anybody else from further victimizing you. Um, one of my resources is FTC, uh, the Federal Trade Commission. They have a great, uh, a, a great um, uh, process for if you have your identity stuff, if your identity stolen, what to do, how to reach out to these credit reporting agencies to, to help mitigate that as much as possible. And how is the FBI addressing digital assets like cryptocurrencies or initial coin offerings? Are there specific initiatives or a team that deal with this type of financial crime? Yeah, the currencies themselves are, are not criminal. 
You know, and, and, and in theory, they have a good purpose. You know, they're designed for people anywhere in the world to have access to, you know, a common currency. And, and so if you were in the middle of, you know, Africa or the middle of, of India or, or the jungles in, in South Africa or South America, you'd have access to a common currency. And, and so in theory, it's, it's, it's a, it has a good purpose. So it, we're not going after uh, the, these currencies, but it's being used for criminal purposes. And so we, we have initiatives around, you know, the cryptocurrency exchanges, the less legitimate ones. You know, the, the, the last number I saw, there's over 400, you know, plus cryptocurrency exchanges out there. And as you can imagine, not all 400 are registered with FinCEN, and a little 400 are, are, are legitimate, you know, are an above board, but there's still a currency uh, that people, or an exchange that people use. So the currencies themselves, whether it's, whether it's Bitcoin or any alt currencies like Monero or whatever it might be, you know, or not, it's just a challenge in our investigations. You know, and if you look at them as a true currency, you know, it's easy for us to track U.S. dollars through the U.S. dollar correspondent banking. And once they change U.S. dollars from U.S. dollars to euros, now we have to track things through euro correspondent banking. Different shift. Same with cryptocurrencies. We can track Bitcoin through the Bitcoin blockchain, but once they transfer that money in some currency exchange from Bitcoin to Monero, now we have to track it through Monero. And it's, it's a way they're washing their money because they have automated tumblers to, to, to go through and, and wash their money. So it's a challenge for us. Um, we're not behind on it, but it's still definitely a challenge. Is that all for now? Fantastic. Keep them coming. Um, when and how to contact the FBI? Whenever you reach out to us, um, if it's a, a significant event or, or a not a significant event, you know, what you'd consider not a significant event, it starts with a phone call. We'll talk to you. We'll, we'll assess what's going on. Um, we'll ask where you're in the process. Did it happen today? Did it happen two weeks ago? Um, have you already hired a, a third-party mitigation company to come in? You know, where are they in the process? Uh, our concern is the preservation of evidence. You know, we don't come in and fix, you know, your systems. Uh, DHS offers that service, you know, but that's not what we're in the business of doing. We want to come in and make sure, you know, in our minds, the, the intrusion is a crime scene, you know, and, and if you look at a physical crime scene like a bank, you know, do you want the bank, from a law enforcement perspective, I don't want the bank to stay operating while I'm responding to the crime scene, you know, and trampling all of this evidence. In the digital environment, you can't stop operating. And so we're working in that environment, so it's an active crime scene that, you know, some of the evidence is getting trampled over. We're aware of this. We work with this all the time. And, and so the earlier we're engaged, the more we can say, can you preserve this? Can you do this? If you can't do it, can we bring somebody out there and do this? And, and we walk through that. Uh, we have a pack list, uh, like a, a packaging list that we send out and say, we would like this. And it's a wish list. If you have it, that's great. Whatever you don't have. You know, one thing is, is a network topography map. You know, show me your, your systems and, and the topography of your systems. Well, not every company has that, and that's a, a pretty big ask, you know, because, you know, it, it's, some people have very sophisticated, complex systems. But what that allows us to do is if you say the breach is in HR systems, what systems touch that, you know, and we can start, we can start minimizing what we want access to. You know, I associate with a surgeon, and, and he's, he's, he's going to do a surgery on the appendix. They put down that, that blue tarp over the rest of your body. So we want to do. We want to put on the blue tarp of the rest of your organization. We want to focus on where the intrusion was and, and, and what they possibly took and whatever evidence is left behind. And we want to identify as quickly as possible so we can send out preservation requests and start preserving evidence, servers they were, they were used abroad, you know, financial information that was used abroad as quickly as possible. And so calling us, our task forces have secret service, and we have other organizations, you know, federal organizations in our task force as well. So we work hand in hand. If you have a friend at secret service, call them. You know, as well, uh, we're a large organization. You know, we have a lot of resources, but we share all of our resources. And, and so they're very competent and capable uh, agents at Secret Service as well, as well as DHS. And, and so keep that in mind. It's more important to reach out and contact and, and talk to um, the law enforcement in that. Some practical tips to, to provide you, you know, how to better protect yourself and, and, and make sure you're doing, you know, the things you should be doing to, to stay safe on this. Yeah, you know, it's good basic cyber hygiene. You've probably heard a lot of these, but you know, hopefully hearing it from me will reinforce what you've heard you know, already previously. You know, your good password, complex passwords. You know, that, and try not to reuse the same password for multiple accounts. You know, I mentioned credential harvesting, and, and they're, trying to, they're testing passwords they receive on several things. 
you know, and they have password keepers. They have other software that, that's out there that I've heard people use to help get around, you know, the inconvenience of having a dozen different passwords. You know, but keep that in mind. Two-factor authentication is huge. You know, I mentioned about them taking their credentials and just testing them, and they had a 1% success rate. Well, a lot of that is, you know, one, people had different passwords, but also having two-factor authentication set up. And so I'm just testing passwords, username and passwords, and you have two-factor authentication set up. That's a fail, even if the username and password is, is, is correct. And so two-factor is pretty important. It's not, it's not set by default on a lot of ISPs, on a lot of email accounts. Even a lot of FIs don't do it as, as, a, as a default. But it's still, uh, it's still very important to, to implement and do it voluntarily if they don't man, uh, mandate it. Uh, update software, update your virus scan, update your malware detectors. Um, have software restriction policies internally. You know, everybody doesn't, have a, doesn't need to have access to everything. And allowing people to download and put anything on your system is dangerous. You know, you're literally giving everybody a window into your organization. And, and people who don't have the experience or the expertise of making an educated decision on whether to or not to put something on your system, um, you know, they shouldn't be able to do that whether they think it's doing something good or if it's malware, unbeknownst to them, they're putting something on their system. You know, if they don't have administration authority on that, on that system, they can't even download malware. And so keep that in mind as well. And I touched on the dual factor authentication. Um, yeah, business continuity is something else you know, somebody had asked about. It's, it's, it's really two good things I have around business continuity is, is have backup recoveries, you know, and depending on the size of your organization and, and, and how expensive it could be, you know, doing backing up regularly Having that separate from your same your systems, um, you know. I live in I live in New York. I've lived in the South. You know, you have natural disasters, so having it physically located somewhere else, you know, and, and having the cloud as an alternative, you know. But having your backups, having backup regular, so if something does happen, you have something you can turn to and get your business up and running almost right away, you know. And practice that. You know, there's a large FI that uh, I go to. I get requested from annually to attend their tabletop exercise. And they have their entire company, every line of business is in there doing their tabletop exercise. And it's very impressive, you know, and, and they practice and they have a, a fusion center in another part of the country and they bring them in, you know, on, on the screen to their corporate headquarters. And it's a full day event. And, and so going through and practicing your backup plan when something happens is important. It's like that fire drill I talked about earlier. And then having network segmentation your through business continuity. If somebody gets into one aspect of your network, you know, ha having it appropriately segmented. So if needed, you know, you have two networks that are connected that shouldn't be connected or have no need to be connected. You know, if you picture an adversary getting into a system, they're walking into a house, you know, completely blind. And so, you know, picture walking into a, a mansion completely blind and you're feeling your way around and you're going to go in any door you can. And the longer you're in there, the more you're going to navigate through this house. You know, if the first floor and second floor are completely blocked off from each other, that person that got access to the first floor will only have access to that one area of your network. And so when you think about network segmentation, it's pretty important to really isolate an event whenever it happens. Uh, resources I talked about, ic3.gov, a huge resource for reporting, not only for reporting stuff to the FBI, but we also have public service announcements out that come out almost monthly, if not uh, every other month. And so it's a wealth of information for people to go to, read, see what our, our latest reporting is on this stuff. We work with our foreign partners in, in accumulating this, and, and we also work with FinCEN. FinCEN has very good PSAs as well. I'm just not sure where on their site it's located. Um, and then I mentioned FTC. Um, FTC has some very good stuff as well. If, you're, if you have a contact within the Bureau, and I, I would recommend having a contact within, within the Bureau, um, we send out to our groups, and we'll use uh, uh, InfraGuard, and there's no restriction to who we send it out to, uh, private industry notification, we call them pins, and then flashes. You know, and so it's updates, it's identifiers, things that we get that we want businesses to know right away, whether it's a current threat. You know, we're trying to put more identifiers in there that the, that the network administrator can build into their network security based on our cases and events that we're seeing. So those pins and flashes are something that, that we send out you know, pretty regularly. Mitch, so what is your questions. opinion on password managers like LastPass? Uh, my personal opinion, I, I can't give a bureau opinion on that because we don't have opinions, but um, <laughs> my personal opinion, I, I think they're good, you know, and I have colleagues that, that use them. Uh, I personally don't use them, but, um, you know, they're good. You have one password, remember, but then you have that single point of failure. 
you know, so if somebody gets access to your password, your manager, uh, by testing that one password, now all of your stuff is exposed. And so there are benefits because it's easier in your mind and, and you're, you're less receptive, you know, but if you have a pass man, password manager on, you know, your one cell phone and this one cell, you, cell phone you heavily protect, and then yeah, it's just probably good. But if you have it on your home computer where your kids and your, your, your maid, if you're rich, and, and anybody else has access to it, you know, now you're, you're waiting on, you know, you're, you're getting makes them more vulnerable to, you know, somebody coming in there. Anything else? Right, that's all the questions from there. I have five minutes left, and so I was efficient. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, sir, I see you over here. Yep. IoT is Internet of Things, so anything that's connected to the Internet is, is considered part of the Internet of Things. So anything from your cell phone to your blender, your refrigerator, your, your Nest, you know, anything that you have that's connected to the Internet. If you, if you look at some of these components, security was not at the front, you know, the front end of, of their development. And so there, some of them are, are very vulnerable to, to being compromised. And so I have not seen them being used to target people you know, or individuals for financial gains. We've, heard, we've seen it in one of our largest cases out of our Anchorage, Alaska office. We've seen it target people for, um, for DDoS. And so some, some kids in Jersey compromised in, in uh, a lot of IoT devices, and they had the largest DDoS network in the world at the time. And, and so they were the DDoS. DDoS is just a distributed denial of service. You focus all these people making a single request on one computer. And so if you look at CNN.com, if all of us in this room go to CNN.com, they could probably handle that, 400 people. If 400,000 people go to CNN.com at one time, it might take it down. Now, they have mitigation things in place, but a DDoS is that distributed and targeted denial of service, whether it's a, a website, whether it's a, a, a login, you know, part of a, a banking platform, whatever it may. So I have not seen it being used yet, um, but the, it, the, the opportunity is there. If you're going to start using it to maybe harvest credentials and then use those credentials to, to, to maybe log in somebody's account. But I've, I've seen them monetize it by renting out their botnets as well. And so prepaid cards, I, we still see those as well. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a shift, you know, from prepaid cards in the more sophisticated actors because this network, this global network for, um, for money laundering is, is so well connected that they don't need the prepaid cards as much anymore. And, and so, you know, they're sending stuff overseas. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a cash out we saw, which was pretty impressive recently, um, where, they, where they got they did a, a targeted cash out in, I think it was 26 different countries, starting at the exact same time, ending within 45 minutes. And they had like 12 or $13 million. And so, you know, if you look at that across time zones and everything, that's pretty impressive. You know, and so that just shows the connectivity within this global network on the criminal side of outsourcing these criminal services. Last question. Sure. Do you find value in pen testing? Almost definitely. Yeah, everybody should test their systems. You know, you, pen, pen testing is penetration testing. You know, uh, some people have, um, have bounties out, you know, for people to test their system. If you can hack my system, I'll give you $10,000 or 1000 or whatever it might be. And so, yes, the value in pen testing, um, in addition to pen testing, sending out emails, phishing emails to people internally. Uh, I heard a company do it not too long ago, and even their IT people clicked on the link. Uh, and, and something else I, I thought was you know, quite comical, they sent out a link that said, um, you know, 2017 bonuses. And they had like a 95% click rate, you know. So it, it's, it, it's, it's pretty impressive what, you know, if you get creative, what you can do to have people click on something internally. Is that it? All right, guys, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hope you got something out of this.